I think we can all agree that suicide is an extremely complicated problem. I'm really out of shape. <laughs> uh, an extremely complicated problem, uh, one in a low base rate behavior uh, in which a confluence of factors interact and come together to produce what is a devastating permanent outcome. It's one, as Tom mentioned earlier, so a lot, a lot of my points um, nicely are, will show good integrated reliability with some of the points that Tom made here. There's been a problem that's been around for thousands of years. He showed data back to 1990. Since the beginning of recorded history, people have talked about suicide as an enormous problem. For thousands of years, philosophers have written about it. Um, but unfortunately, it's one that is still around, and it's still one of the leading causes of death in the U.S. and worldwide. And actually, the, the suicide rate in 2014 is almost exactly what it was in 1914. So over the past 100 years, we haven't seen much of a change. We have made some progress. Um, so we've identified some risk factors. We've identified some potentially useful treatments. But overall, I'd say that progress has been slow, and I would even argue stagnant. Uh, and many of my colleagues who work in mental health and who work in suicide in particular may push back on this conclusion. I don't blame them, as W. Edwards Deming has said, in God we trust, all others must bring data. So I can't use data. Um, so what I want to show are these, this is a study under review for publication from our research group. Um, some of the authors are actually here. This is done by one of our recent postdocs, Joe Franklin. What we did is look at um, studies published over the past 50 years to say what have you learned about risk factors for suicide attempt and suicide death? over the past 50 years. You would hope that over time, uh, well, I'm gonna show our odds ratio. So a, a, a red line is an odds ratio of one. Above one means you have a significant, significant risk factor. You would hope that over time, we're getting better and better at predicting suicidal outcomes. So what do we see? If we look across these decades, a pretty flat line. So the blue line is suicide attempts. The gray, I'm sorry, the gray, gray, blue bars are suicide attempts. The gray bar is suicide death. Pretty flat. It looks like it's decreasing. This is probably because we have more and more cases here to predict from, more and more studies, and so we're getting more accurate. But the overall punchline is we're not getting better at predicting suicidal outcomes, which is concerning. Why aren't we getting better? A big part of the explanation looks like we're not looking at any kind of different risk factors. If you look across these decades, every decade we look at, we're looking at the same top five risk factors. We're looking at demographic factors, internalizing symptoms like depression and anxiety, externalizing symptoms like aggression and impulsiveness, negative life events, and prior self-injurious thoughts and behaviors again and again and again, and in fact, 75 to 80% of all predictions are looking at these same factors over and over again. So it's perhaps not surprising that if we're using the same predictors and the same methods, we're largely using self-report methods, paper and pencil measures, or interviews, same predictors, same methods, we're getting the same results. And as a result, we le we're left with these enormous gaps in our ability to understand, predict, and prevent. So what I'd like to argue, and this is the main gist of my, of my presentation, is that the time is right now for a convergence between the study of this really complex and important problem and the development of new technologies and computing approaches that can help us gain traction in better understanding it, predicting it, and preparing it. The hope is that we can solve it. I agree with Tom, we need to be humble and measured in our approach, but I think we can do a lot better than we've, doing than we've been doing previously. If we look across other areas, this is evident. If you think about how we solve complex math problems, a few years back, we used tools that looked like this. And now we use tools that look like this, and we have huge advances in our ability to do math problems, especially hard ones. If we think about how we travel, how do humans travel? Uh, many years back, if we all wanted to travel to San Jose, we would get a group and walk across the plains, and now we all get our stuff and jump on the plains. And we're able to really hugely change the way that humans interact with each other and the way that things get done in the world. In the domain of health, many years ago, actually not so many years ago, if you had a severe medical problem, let's say you lost a limb, we might get an intervention that looked like this, and now we have robotic arms that can be controlled using the human brain. Fascinating. In the domain of mental health and suicide, if we wanted to know years ago if someone was at risk for suicide, we'd do something that looks like this, and now we do something that looks like this. <laughs> so we're really doing, I mean, we've made huge advances in so many areas, and we haven't really changed much to what we're doing for mental health and for suicide. And our interventions and our assessments, generally speaking, look very similar to what they looked like 100 years ago. So the big question for us today, in my opinion, is what is possible? Uh, what can we do to, to bring the study of mental health and suicide in line with other areas where we've seen these enormous advances? I'm gonna talk about gaps. There, there are many, many gaps to be sure. I will talk about my three favorite ones. First is we need methods for better combining what we already know about risk factors. We do this in many other areas. For instance, in predicting, if you think about predict, how do we predict rare events, like severe uh, weather problems, hurricanes, tornadoes, they don't occur very often, 
but we look at many different variables changing dynamically over time to identify when and where they're most likely to occur in order to try and save human lives. We need nothing like this for suicide. Tom mentioned this as well, we need objective markers of suicide risk. If you, we do a fair amount of work in the emergency department, if you see people come in for a physical problem, they'll get blood tests, they'll get x-rays, they may get an MRI. For suicide, we have very, very few objective tools. And for many areas, we have information about people's imminent uh, likelihood of engaging in behaviors. We have nothing like this for suicide. Um, for instance, we, we know about online consumer behavior. One personal example, my wife yesterday was looking for a fire pit for our backyard. And there's a little thing to put the logs in and you have like s'mores and stuff. She's in our <laughs> kitchen looking up fire pits. I'm in our home office looking at Facebook, spending my standard 15 minutes a day online. And what pops up on the side, ads for fire pits. At the same time, she's looking in our kitchen, it pops up in our study. Amazing what we do to try and solve fire pits and other things. Nothing like this for suicide. Um, so I'm gonna talk about, these are the gaps. But also, we can think of these as exciting opportunities for advance. And I'm gonna talk about just some really, uh, I'll focus on some of our own work. So my mediocre, primitive steps forward, but I'm really looking forward to, to talking to many of you today about how we can push it forward in these areas. So first, what do we know about combining risk factors? As I mentioned earlier from the meta-analytic data, and I apologize, I know we're a little behind time, I'm from the New York, New Jersey area, so I tend to speak very quickly, so those from that region will be with me, the rest of you, I apologize, but I'll hang around if you have questions later on. Um, we know about risk factors for suicide attempts, for lifetime attempts, for 12-month attempts. Virtually all available studies look at bivariate linear associations between each of these factors and some suicidal outcome. We, what we really need are methods of combining this information in ways that better predict these outcomes. Uh, just one example of how this could be done, this is a study that our group uh, did as part of the Army study to assess risk and resilience among service members, which was supported by Tom and, and NIMH, and this is a paper led by my colleague Ron Kessler. We know, this is looking at Army soldiers post-hospitalization. We know that when people leave the hospital with a psychiatric diagnosis, the time after the discharge is one of the highest risk times for suicide death. So what predicts this high risk? What was done in this study is look at 54,000 hospitalizations, and what we did was use machine learning approaches to create a risk score for each person, for, for each hospitalization actually. What's the predicted probability of a suicide death in the next 12 months among each hospitalization? We gave each hospitalization a risk score and then organized these into different ventiles. And what I'm showing here are highest risk ventile, so top 5% on the left, all the way down to the lowest 5% on the right. And what we see is, in the highest 5%, this group accounted for 52% of all suicides over the next 12 months. So if you think about this and try and find needles in a haystack, what we can do with, with big data, with machine learning approaches is identify the haystack with the highest concentration of needles. Still early on, we're not nearly there yet. A lot of false positives using this approach. Interestingly though, an interesting wrinkle is this top 5%, nearly half of these folks, if they didn't die by suicide in the next 12 months, they died by accident, they made a non-lethal suicide attempt, or they were otherwise hospitalized. So a lot of negative outcomes are overlapping in terms of this risk score. So all of this was done, notably, without asking people a single question. This is all using data lying dormant in their medical record or in other administrative records. This is done in the Army uh, with another research team at Harvard. We're looking at doing this in civilian healthcare systems. So looking at data in the partner's healthcare system, the Harvard system, uh, across over a million um, uh, patients, we are able to develop a machine learning approach that identifies 40% of suicides, on average, about three years before they occur. And we're in the process of trying to replicate this in seven other healthcare systems around the country. So again, early, primitive, lots of false positives, but just an example of what can be done if we take some uh, emerging technologies and direct them toward this problem. We also need objective markers of suicide risk. The state of the art, as I showed right now, is asking people, are you thinking about suicide? Do you want to kill yourself? This is problematic for a number of reasons that are obvious to probably most of you, People who are thinking about suicide often are motivated to deny or conceal these thoughts because they don't want to be intervened upon, just like those who are violent or uh, use substances or abuse children. They don't want to tell others because they don't want to be stopped. Um, we know that suicidal thoughts tend to be transient in nature, so they may not be there when a person is assessed. And we know that many people lack, con I mean, all people lack conscious awareness of all the factors that are influencing our, influencing our behavior in different ways. We know that these are problems because about 80% of people who die by suicide explicitly deny suicidal thoughts or intentions in their last communication before dying. So what we need are methods of assessing risk that don't just rely on self-report. So for instance, we have a patient, practically speaking, in front of us saying, I don't want to hurt myself, I don't want to kill myself. What we really want to know is, what is this person thinking about suicide? 
or were they thinking about some other behavior problem or, or mental health condition that they may not be telling us? How, do we, how might we be able to use advances in computing to understand what's happening in a person's mind? Well, fortunately, over the past few decades, social and cognitive psychologists have developed computer-based methods to do exactly this. Uh, and so we can now measure what we think of as implicit suicidal cognitions, or unspoken um, mental associations a person holds about suicide. Uh, one way we do this is with a test called the implicit association test. Who's heard of this test? About a third or so of people. So I'll just very quickly describe this. So this is a computerized test, about five minutes, and it uses your reaction time, reaction time to measure how you think about different concepts, in this case, suicide. And it's based on the fact that people, if, we're, if we ask you to classify words onto the left or the right, so putting things into different bins, you make that classification more quickly for things that are similar to each other, the things that you associate as being like each other. Like I should say, classify boys versus girls, you'll classify the girls all together and the boys all together much more quickly uh, than, than some kind of other combination. So first we say to people, push the left button for death-related words or me-related words, push a right button on your screen for light words or not me words. You can play along if you're so interested, say left or right, so you'll see a stimulus appear, suicide, so that's death-related, so we push the left key, so with me now, left, left, thank you in the front, right, 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 left, and so on. So we'll do this task, well, they'll do the task, we'll measure the response time in milliseconds, now we switch it. Now we pair life in me. And what we think is that people who are suicidal will be faster responding when death and me are paired because if you want to die, you associate death as being like you. If you don't want to die, you associate life as being more like you. So we do. We have people do 40 trials of each of these pairings and subtract one from the other. And we did this with people who came through a psychiatric emergency department. So after discharge, they're at high risk for suicide attempts to see do people differ based on how they score in this task. And what we see is, on the right, these are people who are faster responding when death and me are paired, and on the left are when life and me are paired. People who are faster responding when death and me are paired have three times the rate of suicide attempts over the next six months as those who are faster responding when life and me are paired. So this test is able to, we think, detect suicidal thinking and identify those at high risk for suicide attempts. We find that performance on this test significantly improves prediction above and beyond commonly used factors, beyond diagnosis, beyond clinician's own prediction, beyond patient's own prediction, beyond self-report measures, with fairly good accuracy. And uh, we gave this to an independent research group in Canada. They did a very similar study and found very similar results. So this seems to be a test that can identify suicide-related thinking, again, using advances in computing power. Uh, we wonder, do we see this in the general population? And so this is a, a, we put this test up on a website, if you are so interested, called implicitmentalhealth.com where you can take these tests or any other tests related to implicit cognition about anxiety or depression or eating and so on. And in a study um, done by Jeff Glenn, see that's on the table here, raise your hand, Jeff. There he is. Uh, collected data from 6,000 people and found similar pattern of results where uh, we had a significant difference between those who made an attempt and those who didn't. And actually, the more recently you made an attempt, the higher your scores on this test. So this is just one example of many different computerized tests that can detect suicidal thinking and predict, and predict suicidal behavior. A big challenge that we've been thinking about, and I'd love to hear people's thoughts on, is how do we, how and when do we get these tests in front of people who need them? We test people in the ER. We already have a sense of our risk because we're coming to the psychiatric emergency room, or we administer it online anonymously. How can we merge these tests with other approaches to get them in the hands of people at the right time? And speaking of the right time, this brings me to the final gap, and that is how do we get better data on imminent risk? Most data that we have, thinking back to our meta-analysis over the past 50 years, looks at predictors of suicidal attempts and death over a year or longer. So this pie chart shows what period of time was looked at for all suicide studies over the past 50 years, prediction studies. Only 2% try and predict suicide in the next month. All the rest, more than three quarters, try and predict a year out or longer. Impressive if you can predict suicide a year out or longer, but ask any clinician or friend or family member of someone at risk. They are much more interested in predicting these behaviors over the next hours or days or weeks. And it requires a much, great, much different intervention. What would you do if you know someone's at risk for suicide a year from now versus a day from now? We really need to get better at, at the shorter term. And we haven't really had the technology to do that. No studies have really done that to date. Um, so we need studies that identify high-risk groups. And again, as Tom was mentioning, continuously monitoring people over time within, within participants. And we now have the ability to do this, of course, with smartphones that many of us have, we can continuously monitor people with an ecological monetary assessment approach um, and do the, the digital phenotyping work that John and JP and others have been 
advocating and measure, for instance, the onset of suicide ideation, maybe the increases in frequency leading up to a suicide attempt, maybe other characteristics change in time leading up to a suicide attempt. We have no idea because we have never done this work before. A few of us have started to do studies on this, but there's still a lot more that can be done. I know a lot of people here are working with mobile technologies and developing apps that can do this kind of thing. <coughs> huge, huge, huge opportunities for advancement in this area. Newer studies are incorporating um, apps that are designed especially for this, looking at things like web searches, um, looking at the, the incorporation of, of biosensors uh, using the old style we did was lecture. Now we use the Empatica device to, to try and measure people at high risk in real time to see if we can identify biological or behavioral signatures that are associated with increased risk of suicide attempt. But the sky is really the limit here, and, and this is a really unexplored territory, and one from a suicide perspective that needs your help and needs, you, needs the help of people working in this area. We can also start to push out interventions. This is the last thing that I'll that I'll mention. Um, there are lots of different apps that get created to try and treat people with different mental conditions. I'm going to describe one um, that our research group developed, again, led by Joe Franklin, postdoc. He had a great year, the meta-analysis and the, and, the, and the app. So this is a brief conditioning app. It's a game-like app played on your smartphone. And I don't know if people have kids or ever were a child yourself. You know the match game where you try and match different faces? It's kind of like that. And you get randomly assigned to a treatment or a control condition. This paper just came out uh, within the past few weeks. People who get assigned to the treatment condition are asked to repeatedly pair self-injury or suicide-related stimuli with aversive stimuli, like snakes or spiders and so on. You play for, and people in the control condition pair neutral things with each other. And what we're trying to do is condition people to have an aversion towards self-injury or suicide-related behavior. We recruit people who are self, already self-injurious or suicidal to see sort of like Clockwork Orange, but I hope no one's recording this, recording this, not at all like Clockwork Orange. <laughs> but we're trying to condition people to have to build up an aversion to the idea of self-injury or suicide in a way that is in no way, shape, or form like Clockwork Orange. <laughs> so we tested this out, and there's a lot of, like John uh, uh, and many will tell you, there's a lot of apps out there. We don't know which work or which don't. There's big concerns about replicability in the field. So we conducted, in one study, three randomized clinical trials to say, does this actually work? And what we find is that people who get assigned to the control condition show over a one month period, huge reductions in self-cutting, suicide planning, and suicidal behaviors. Outcomes that are really difficult to treat and which we're lacking um, compelling evidence-based interventions. So early results suggest that we can use apps. Not all apps work, we've developed several different approaches that don't work. This is one that does seem to work consistently, suggesting that there are things that we can do targeting things like implicit cognition or implicit affect to change people's downstream behavior. So it's encouraging that, uh, that we're seeing some advances in this area. So in conclusion, what I hope to convey is that there are lots of opportunities to advance three areas in particular that, that are ripe for uh, advancement are the use of available data, big data to get better at predicting who's at risk for these outcomes, trying to develop more objective measures to identify who's at risk because we can't continue to rely on a person's self-report, we really need more work on short-term prediction of these outcomes. Um, again, we can do this for fire pits, we need to do this for suicide, for self-injury, for other uh, harmful outcomes. Some key challenges, I'll end with these. If we can generate risk scores for people, what do we do with them? Do we give them to clinicians? Do we give them to, to patients themselves? If a person's coming into a hospital for a, 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 a flu, and our algorithm runs in the background and says, hey, this person's at high risk of suicidal behavior, and they're not thinking about suicide, should we tell them? Should we not tell them? What's the right thing to do there? How should we tell the clinician in a way that's being most helpful? Really challenging things for us to, 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 to wrestle with, and I'm curious to hear people's thoughts. There's likely to be heterogeneity of assessment effects and treatment effects. There's lots of apps out there for assessment intervention. Which ones are gonna work best with which people at what points in time? We can get the answer, but it's not gonna be as easy as I think a lot of us thought to begin with. And finally, what are the ethics involved here? It, we're increasingly, and others are increasingly moving towards passive monitoring and passive interventions. The intervention like the one I just showed you can be pushed out to people as a game, and it might intervene on their behavior. Is it ethical to, to track people using passive monitoring, identify those who are at risk for suicidal behavior, and push them out implicit interventions without them knowing? Some would say, yes, of course, we're identifying people at risk and driving down the risk of devastating behavior. On the other hand, there's some ethical concerns to intervening with people without them knowing and agreeing to it. So I look forward to, to hearing your thoughts on this and discussing this over the course of the day. And in closing, don't forget to call your mom. Uh, and happy Mother's Day to all the moms who are here. Thank you.